Thank you, sweetheart. And by the way, Emily will turn 13 this week, February 14th. She's our Valentine baby. So she's a special sweetheart that God has given to us. Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Amos. I provided you with a handout on the way into chapel about the literary structure of the book of Amos. I've also given you just chapter 5. Uh, I'm not going to be preaching this out per se, but it might help you find where I am because I hope that God will give me the freedom to be all over the book of Amos today. So uh, my goal is to, uh, is to get into the book of Amos, actually let the book of Amos get into me, and let God just uh, get, let him have glory, whatever he wants to do, to God be the glory today. As I deliver not merely a sermon, but a burden that God has placed upon my heart. Now, you're going to have to help this morning. And I, I solicited the friends of my carpool this morning, uh, Dr. Nix and Dr. Griffin and Dr. Rakowski, that they would help me lead you in a chorus. And, and so here's, uh, here's what I want us to do. Now, I want us to start off being very formal. And the chorus that's going to start here, now, Dr. Nix, you don't have to sing, brother, all right? All right, we, we settled that this morning in carpool, but, but the chorus is, is that uh, they deserve God's judgment. So, so let's start it over here. We're going to let the, the, the choral group from the men start right here, and let's just rip it through. So, starting one, two, three, they deserve God's judgment. Let's do it again. They deserve God's judgment. Now, as we get it going, we could just simply say they deserve God's judgment or they deserve it. Because when we say they deserve it, we mean they deserve what? God's judgment. You see, Amos begins his book with a series of oracles against the nations in chapters 1 and 2. And just look with me quickly as we begin here in verse 3. He says, for three transgressions of Damascus, yet for four, I will not revoke its punishment. And right there you say what? They what? They deserve God's judgment. Now, this is a Baptist seminary, and you can do much better than that. So, let's do it again. It says down here in verse 6, For three transgressions of God's and for four, I will not revoke their punishment. And you say, They deserve God's judgment. That's getting better. They deserve God's judgment. But look in verse, uh, verse 9, and we find out, For three transgressions of Tyre, yet for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because... You can't rest. We've got more to go. And down in verse 11, for three transgressions of Edom, yet for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they deserve God's judgment. Well, Amos goes on, but let me make a, a point of application here as we begin this message, because I want you to know that God will not revoke their punishment. You see, this is a hill and imperfect here, and he says that God will not turn it or him back that God is not going to let them turn back, that God is going to let them run into that wall. God is going to let them run off that cliff. God is going to let them smack judgment head on because God will not revoke their judgment, their punishment. And what? They deserve. They deserve God's judgment. And so we come along to famous, to infamous people and nations of the past, and they rightly deserve, they rightly deserve our scorn, and they rightly deserve God's judgment. I mean, I could, mention his name, I could mention names like Napoleon and Hitler and Mussolini, and you would say, they deserve God's judgment. And I could mention people like Genghis Khan and Stalin and Idi Amin, who used to eat the flesh of people in Africa, and you would say, they deserve God's judgment. And I could mention groups like Hamas and Hezbollah and the Taliban, and you would say, they deserve God's judgment. But then I could mention America. Where as of this morning, 49,551,703 unborn babies have been put to death by abortion. And you should say? But our heart's not in it. Because we're Americans. Because this is a land that we love. Home of the free and the brave. But in America, we have drugs, and alcohol, and abortion, and teen pregnancy, and incest, and abuse, and pornography. In America, we have gangsters, and mafia, and we've got the 9-11, and we've got our own Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber. And we've got Ted Kaczynski, the, the Unabomber. We've got all kinds of people in America that what? Deserve God's judgment. 
Why do we believe for a minute that we, America, are going to be outside the wrath of God when the wrath of God falls for sin? Because what Amos did is he turned to the Israelites and he turned to every nation around them and he started to the north and then to the, to the west and to the east and to the south and he looked at all the nations that were giving Israel problems and he said, they what? They deserve God's judgment. And that rhythm sing song, that sings just grew and grew as the people of Amos' day as they heard that God, he knew the sins of Damascus, he knew the sins of the Moabites, he knew the sins of the Edomites, he knew the sins of Tyre, he knew the sins of, of all the enemies of God, and then he turned and said, for three sins yet for four of Israel. And the crowd got very quiet. Somebody punched somebody else that had dozed off and said, hey, is he talking about us? Amos exactly was talking about us. He was talking about the people who believe themselves to be God's people. But it's not just America that deserves God's judgment. But is it not we, the church, too? For three sins, yet for I will not revoke its punishment. The church has declined. Dr. Kelly has made this clear. Dr. Kelly, there are many times you say that, I'm like a little quieter, Dr. Kelly. It's on our watch. We don't want to tell everybody that on our watch the church has declined. That 70 to 90 percent of the churches have declined. But on our watch, the church has declined. We're more interested in making budget than making a difference. We're more interested in buildings and programs than we are principles. We're more interested in experiencing a worship event than living a life of worship. We're more interested in ritual and not relationship. We're more interested in attendance than in holiness. We're more interested in the number of pages read rather than the Word of God being hit in our heart that we might not sin against God. We've become all about the show, but not about the practice. For three sins yet, for four, what? They deserve God's judgment. Amos began his message by telling the people of his day, God knows your sin. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this morning, God knows my sin. God knows your sin. God knows our sin. And yet, I'm just like Habakkuk, I don't quite understand how a righteous God could allow an unrighteous people to bring judgment against a more righteous people. God, I'm going to go to my rampart and I'm going to watch because I'm going to stand there until I see you bring judgment against those wicked people coming against us. And God said, you can stand and look all you want, but the just shall live by faith. You see, God is not going to exempt the church. God is not going to exempt America. God is not going to exempt Christians around the world from going through difficult times. Because on our watch, we have allowed pornography. On our watch, we have alcoholism. On our watch, we have allowed abortion. It is our church members in our counties and our parishes who have passed laws that allow our businesses to sell liquor and whatever else they sell. It's not their fault. It's our fault. And Amos is getting to the heart of the problem. You see, it was a people problem. In chapter 4 and chapter 6, Amos starts with the issue and ladies first. In chapter 4, it's, hear this word, you cows of Bashan. You know, preachers today, we can't very well stand up and talk to the heifers of our community because we wouldn't last very long as pastors, would we? But Amos stood up and said, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. Amos says, we got a people problem. And it begins with our ladies. Ladies first. And they said, oh, I don't want to be first. You go for the men. Amos said, I'm starting right here. He said, we got ladies that are living in luxury and they are ordering their husbands around. And because they want a luxuriant lifestyle, because they want materialism, because they want the good things of life, they want the good life. 
They want two cars. They want a, they want carpet or hardwood floors. They want all the wonderful accoutrements of life. They want everything that life has to give because they're interested in materialism. And because of these things, Amos said, we've got a people problem. We've got women who are leading their homes. Sounds like they've got a family problem. Sounds like they're not living in godliness. Sounds like they're not listening to the word of their God. And so here's Amos, and he's saying, ladies, you're first. Until the ladies of the homes get their hearts right with God, there's going to be problems. But not just that. Go with me to chapter 6. He said, now you men, you just thought you were going to get missed. You thought I started with the women, but I want to tell you, you don't have a second chance to make a first impression, but the last impre lasting impression. And he goes to the men. And he says here in chapter 6, he says, One of those who are at ease in Zion and who feel secure in the mountain of Samaria, the distinguished men of the foremost nations... To whom the house of Israel comes. Oh, he points out the men. Amos said, we've got a people problem. And the problem that we've got is that people are into religion and not into covenant. They're into ritual and not into relationship. The people had reduced the practice of godliness, the practice of holiness. They had reduced it to the ritual of going to a holy place. Let me tell you what, in Israel it was not difficult to find a place of worship. Why you had you had Dan and you had Bethel, but not only Dan and Bethel, you had a high you had a high place, you had a grove, you had a tree, you had a sacred pillar, and everywhere they went, there was some place where you could have a, a worship experience where you could go light your incense and burn your candles. You could you could do your thing on that hill. Oh, it's a beautiful day, honey. Let's go out with a basket. Let's go worship God out and they wonderful out there. And these people were going to the north and the south. Why they had camp meetings, they had Gilgal and they had Beersheba. They would go down to camp meeting, they'll go to camp meeting revival. Well, they wanted to go and have their religious uh, pilgrimage, their festival stories. And so here they would go singing the songs of God, singing the chants of how God did great things in the past of this white people. Nobody asking the question, is this pleasing God? Because you see, they were so full of religion, they were so full of religiosity, they were so full of ritual, that they had forgotten that what God was, was a covenant keeping God. What God was, was a covenant promising God. What God was, was a God who demanded that His people live by His word and live holy. It's easy to get up and read our Bibles. And you say, come on, Dr. England. <laughs> okay, it's a struggle to get up and read our Bibles and to pray and to do the work of ministry and to lead our people to do these things. But unfortunately, we've made it too easy. We've made checklist Christianity. We create boxes and these boxes are places for me to check that I have read my Bible, that I have memorized my verse, that I have shared Christ with some lost soul this week, that I have attended church on Sunday morning and Sunday night, that I have withheld my anger against somebody who deserved it, that I have practiced good deeds toward those who are in need. It is so easy to create standards by which we can measure our impact. You know, the three B's, building and baptisms, or the two N's, nickels and noses. Take your pick, you know. It doesn't matter. But we have created these paradigms. That if we're pastoring a church that grows from 30 to 150, or from 150 to 1,500, or from 1,000 to 5,000, that we are growing a church. But is God being glorified? Is the Holy Spirit of God in control? Are people confessing their sin? Are they walking in righteousness? Are they saying no to iniquity? Or have we created a religion of the northern Israelites to where if we can but get them into church, let's not tell them about the demands of a holy God. Let's not preach to them about the law of Moses. Let's not tell them what God demands. Let's not require of them church discipline. I had an argument with a church. That church discipline's not in the Bible. And finally when I showed them where it was, they reviled me. Well, how can you be right because no pastor before you has ever taught this to me? Men of God, do your job. Preach the Word. Preach the whole counsel of God. 
Do not preach the fun parts. Don't preach just the love of God. Preach the wrath of God. Preach the justice of God. Preach the glory of God. In fact, that's Amos's choice. Go back with me to Amos chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. He begins with his dental theology. But I also gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. Now, that didn't mean that they had just been the dentist. It meant they had been hungry for a long, long time. They had had famine. He says, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and a lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Amos 4, 7. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there was still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water, but you would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I smote you with scorching wind and mildew, you, and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, tre fig trees and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your captured horses. And I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. Say it with me. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze. Say it with me. Yet you have not returned to me. Therefore... Thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God. Amos said the people had a problem. It was a people problem, a problem of the heart. And Amos said the only solution to the people problem is God. Look at that next verse, verse 13. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and treads on high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. Amos says the, the only solution to the problem we have is a God solution. Only until God gets glorified, only until God gets served, only until God gets obeyed will the church get right. Only when the Christians get right with God will the world get right. Because the world is looking at us and they're saying, what standard are you living by? We see you count nickels and noses and we see buildings and budgets and baptisms. But what we don't see is we don't rinse. And the world is looking at the church saying, why are only 69 out of 100 of children in church having, having teenage pregnancies when 93% of the world is? Why are people in the church using abortion like birth control? Why are people in the church getting divorced? Why are people in the church involved in all these sins and iniquity? Until we return to God, there will be no revival. Revival tarries because we took Amos 4.12 this way. Papa, did you hear? The Lord's coming for revival. I've got to get out my white goods and I've got to set the table. Did you hear? God's coming for revival. It's so good. God's coming. Amos is like, no, that's not it. Yes, God is coming, but He's not coming to come sit at your table. He's not coming to sample your good cooking. God's not coming to fellowship with you. He's not coming to put His arm around you and say, Oh, I've been looking so forward to meeting you, you Jacob and your wife and your beautiful children. God's on His way with judgment. And what do we say? Because... They deserve God's judgment. Let's change it. It's because we deserve God's judgment. Or maybe even more personal. Because I deserve God's judgment. Amos identified a people problem. People were living large. They had money and land and power. They had beef and chicken. Can't say they had pork, the Jewish, remember. They had all kinds of good foods. They were enjoying the good life. And somebody looked at someone else and said, Why is God coming? We've got churches and chapels on every hill. We've got worship services every day of the week. We've got Bible studies all the time. What is God so angry with? Have we not spread the word? Have we not planted congregation after congregation? Synagogue after synagogue? Why is God so angry? 
because you have not returned to me. And so in the middle of the book of Amos, in the middle of the literary structure, the handout I've given you, write the heart of the book of Amos. Well, that's the priority thing. Getting right with God. He says in 5.4, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live. Don't go, to Be don't go to Bethel. Don't come to Gilgal. Don't cross over to Bathsheba. For Gilgal will certainly go into captivity and Bethel will come to trouble. Seek, Lord, that you may live. Amos says that we are to seek good. We are to seek God. We are to seek the Lord. We are to turn from our wicked ways. And somebody says to another, well, I didn't realize we were that wicked. What's wrong with us? And Amos said, that's the problem. I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but i got 20-20 vision that God's coming. And God's going to come and bring judgment. He saw these visions of judgment. That God was going to send the locust and the land was going to be devoured in chapter 7. And then God was going to send the fire and burn the whole earth up. And then He was going to send, what? The plumb line. And God said, you're not in plumb line. You're not right with God. You're not plumb. You're not square. You're off balance. And then He said, Amos, what do you see? In the beginning of chapter 8, He said, I see a basket of fruit. And God said, you're right. You see the end of things. Overripe, overdone fruit. That's what you see. You see God about to come in judgment. Brothers and sisters and friends, colleagues, our problem is if we have a problem, I think we do, is that we have grown to enjoy playing religion. We enjoy religiosity. You know, the emergent church is teaching me something. Now, I may be wrong about this, but let me give you the three observations I have about lessons to a church in the postmodern age from an emerging church that I don't know where they're from, okay? But the emerging church. Number one, the emerging church movement is more comfortable out of church than in it. They're less comfortable with the structures and the infrastructure of the traditional church. You don't typically see the emerging church trying to identify itself by buildings or budgets or baptisms. In fact, the second observation is, is that they're happier mixing with the world than separating themselves from it. We don't find the, we don't find any kind of teetotaler attitude among the emerging church. They're as happy drinking beers at a bar as they are, uh, having Bible study. Now, that doesn't characterize everyone in the emerging church, but it characterizes the ideology of, of, of the emerging church. They're out mixing it up with society. And that leads me to the third conclusion that I see from the emerging church. They're far less interested in our hypocritical ways. Now, let me rephrase that. The emerging church would fit the Christianity of Charles Haddon Spurgeon rather well. Spurgeon looked at that young man and said, can you smoke that cigar to the glory of God? And the young man fumbling took it out of his mouth. No. Spurgeon said, give it here, I can. <laughs> you see, the emerging church is far less interested in hiding their hypocrisy. I drink, I smoke, I do these things. Now, I don't do these things, but that's what they say. I, I do these things. And, uh, and you know, that's who I am. I'm a sinner. God forbid we go to our churches and we are scared to death. Somebody's going to find out about our sin. How can we have revival if we go to church covering up our sin so tight that no one can see who we really are? Dr. Kelly and others are prophets in our midst making the clarion call to the church that if we don't stop playing religion, we will continue to fail. Because what God demands is He demands that we seek Him, that we turn from our iniquities, that we stop our transgressions, and that we seek God. Look down in verse 14. He says, seek good and not evil. That's just common sense. So that you may live. And thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you. And I love this phrase. Just as you have said. 
These people didn't claim that they were outside of the will of God. They claimed they were in the will of God. And they were going around saying God loves us. God's got a wonderful plan for our lives. I'm sorry, that's four spiritual laws. But they were going around saying these wonderful things about God. And Amos said, just like you like to say, you ought to get on God's team. You ought to be doing good, not evil. Brothers and sisters, we need to start taking stands. Uncomfortable stands, unpopular stands, unfavorable stands. We need to be willing to be shot, to be maligned, to be put down, to be persecuted. Because if we stand for nothing, then what's going to happen? And we'll prevail. Amos said it's time to change your priorities. It's time to change from it's all about me. It's all about it's all about worship. It's all about music. It's all about sermon style. It's all about our church programs. It's all about our church budgets. It's turn. It's time to turn from these priorities to our only hope. And our only hope is God. Amos said that we must seek the Lord. But you see, the third and final point of my message this morning is, is that it's an issue of integrity. God must judge. He said in chapter 8, turn with me to chapter 8, he said that he was coming in judgment. And he said in verse 11, he said, Behold, the days declares the Lord God when I'll send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water. He, re he refers back to, the, to Exodus chapter 16 and 17 when they, they cried out for food and they cried out for water and then they cried out for victory from war. He reminds them that he's the God who brought their forefathers out of Egypt. And he says it won't be a famine of food, it won't be a famine of water. He says, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. The people who came, out, came up out of Egypt, I mean, good morning, Lord, there was the pillar of the pillar of cloud by day. Good night, Lord. There was the pillar of fire by night. Good morning, Lord. There's manna on the ground. Good evening, Lord. There's quail falling at their feet. Those people at that time in Exodus had seen the power of God outpoured. They woke up and went to bed every night with the evidence of the power of God all around them. And yet they grumbled and murmured and complained that they weren't enjoying life like Egypt. And Amos says to these people, the day is coming when people will stagger from sea to sea, from north even to east, and they'll throw to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. They're going to be having camp meetings and revivals, and they're going to be having Bible studies, and they're going to be having crusades, and they're going to be making all these announcements in the name of God. But God is not interested in our religion. God is interested in our relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of His Holy Spirit. And brothers and sisters, we're not in the business of building buildings. We're not in the business of planning programs. We're not in the business of getting decisions. We're in the Great Commission business of discipling those who've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amos tells us that the judgment of God was coming. He said to the Israelites in chapter 9 and verse 7, he said, I look at the sons of Ethiopia, those who are dark-skinned, I look at you and I can't tell the difference. And the Israelites say, here God, here's my glasses, need some help? We're lighter skinned than they are. God says, what you morons, you think I'm looking at your skin? I'm looking at the heart. I can't tell the difference between the black heart of the Gentiles and the black heart of the Israelites who, don't, who aren't walking for God anymore. He said to these people, he said, Behold, the eyes, verse 8, are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it. Now, let me, let me play with you here for a second. I'll destroy it a little bit. No, he says, I'll destroy it from the face of the earth. Nevertheless, I will not totally destroy it. The house of Jacob, declares the Lord. No, instead, he says about the house of Jacob, he says about a future hope, he says, Behold, in that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David, its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. And James uses this in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council to say, 
that God is going to claim from the Gentiles a people by His name, just like He's going to claim from the Jews, because God is going to raise up the fallen booth of David, that one day through the lineage of David that would fall, God would raise up one. And you know that one to be? This is your turn. Who is it? Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And so I close with this. Judgment's coming. Which side are you on? Are you on the side of robust religion? Or are you on the side of a personal relationship with God the Father through Christ the Son? Church roles and church statistics are not going to honor God. What's going to honor God? If His people who are called by His names will do what? Will humble themselves and seek His face and call on His name. Then God, then God will turn and heal our land. Let's pray that God of the harvest will preach Amos' message every Sunday that we have a God-sized problem and we're not going to fix it with crusades and revivals and camp meetings and we're not going to fix it with Sunday morning sermons and Sunday night sermons. The only thing that's going to fix it is a relationship with God. So let's be in the sales business of telling people about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. That's my favorite phrase. Dr. Kelly, I'm in sales, not administration. I thank God for you, but I'm in sales because it does my heart good to tell people about how God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes what? On Him shall be saved. Brothers and sisters, seek God and live. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father God, for your word. Now use it in our lives, in our hearts, to change us. That we might stop thinking of Hamas and Hezbollah and the Taliban and Osama bin Laden. That we might stop thinking about politicians and politics. That we might stop thinking about ideologies as our problems. Because, Father, our problem is a heart problem. And what we need desperately is you, O sovereign God to touch our hearts and change our lives. And so, Father God, start here. Start now. Start with me. Start with us. Start with our families. And God, if you be pleased, bring revival that we might help our world to prepare to meet you, O oh God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.